Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to our conversation with Sibylla Peretti and Diane Wright. Um, we are so happy to have uh, both of them here and happy that you could join us tonight. I am going to start by introducing um, our two speakers and then we will um, turn it over. I will turn it over to them. Um, Sibylla Peretti um, is an artist who we have had the pleasure of representing for the better part of the past 20 years now. Sibylla is a, um, a German born um, and is a graduate of the State School of Glass in Zweisel, Zweisel Germany, as well as um, uh, the Academy of Fine Arts in Cologne, where she received um, her master's um, MFA in sculpture and painting. She has been a practicing artist um, ever since, and um, she has made glass sculptures and multimedia collages which combine photography and drawings with surface interventions such as engraving, mirroring, and glass slumping, and has won prestigious awards and endorsements for her work, including the 2013 United States Artist Fellowship, as well as grants from the Paula Krasner Foundation and the Joan Mitchell Foundation. Sibylla's uh, solo exhibition, um, Promise and Perception, the, the Enchanted Landscapes of Sibylla Peretti was uh, curated by Diane and featured at the Chrysler Museum of Art um, in Norfolk, Virginia in 2018. Sibylla's work is represented in a number of public collections, including the Barry Art Museum in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, the New Orleans Museum of Art, the Corning Museum of Glass, the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the Montreal Museum of Fine Art in um, Montreal, Canada, as well as uh, the Museum of Applied Arts in Frankfurt, Germany, and the Speed Museum in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, most recently, a major piece of hers, Mississippi Banks, was acquired by the Toledo Museum of Art last year. So welcome, Sibylla. And um, I will do a quick introduction for um, Diane as well. Diane received her MA in the History of Decorative Arts from Parsons, um, the new school for design. She has held positions at the Corning Museum of Glass, Pilchuck Glass School, and Yale University Art Gallery, and has taught extensively on the history of glass. Her current research focuses on making connections between historic objects and contemporary makers working in craft-based mediums. Diane was appointed the Curator of Glass and, the De and Decorative Arts at the Toledo Museum of Art in 2017, and previously she was the Carolyn and Richard Berry Curator of Glass at the Chrysler Museum, where she published um, Glass, Masterworks from the Chrysler Museum of Art, and curated 11 exhibitions, including Sibylla's exhibition that we just mentioned, that I just mentioned. And in Toledo, uh, she has curated celebrating Libby Glass, 1818 to 2018, Catherine Gray being in a hot shop, as well as um, The Path to Paradise, Judith Schechter's stained glass art, which just opened at the museum on October 3rd. She has championed key acquisitions for the TMA, including works by Viola Fry, uh, Joy Scott, Sibylla Peretti, Amber Cowan, Stina Bitstrup, Olga de Amaral, and Monir Farma Farmayan, the first contemporary Iranian artist whose uh, work had entered the Toledo's collection. I am thrilled to have both of them here tonight, and um, I will turn this over to them. So, um, Sibylla, do you want to start, please? So, I, of course, I want to thank um, Katya and the Heller Gallery to organize this, this little conversation. And it's really nice to at least connect with everybody, at least this way. Um, somehow we feel quite isolated down here in the South. And so I'm really thankful that all you guys are joining. And I see a, a few familiar names and that's, that makes it a lot of fun. So I, I basically will um, just talk a little bit about the inspiration, especially behind my um, landscapes. 
I basically look for uh, landscapes that are kind of temporal and fragile and the ones I think disappear sooner or later, either ways um, due to human expansion or flooding or maybe many other reasons. And for me, uh, these are places where we can somehow um, reflect on loss or hope or maybe uh, have memories. And with, with my work, I try to preserve them as spaces where we can find, where we, where we can kind of find a, um, a, a peaceful moment or a, a kind of solitude. And for me, it's also like creating the last refuge. So um, when I start these wall, wall murals at the end, they are in glass, but the photograph is always a starting point in this work. And this um, is right where I live. It's not very far at the Mississippi banks in New Orleans. I mean, that's like a, a huge step, but you, you still can see the photograph in this piece. So this is a translation into glass. Of course, it underwent like a million different steps, um, way too, you don't have enough time to go into all these different steps. But um, anyway, for me, it's like that I use more or less the photograph as a stage setting in where nature combined with figures, animals, or maybe other elements create a kind of new um, reality. And for me, it's also important, uh, it's hard to see, but for me, it's important to use, um, you see here like branches and areas. And these are like uh, things I find on the specific side, these branches, and then I, I use them to slump the glass over these branches. And for me, it's it's like um, that I this way that that I that I preserve them actually. It's it's a little bit like a fingerprint of that specific space that would be otherwise lost. Katya mentioned already my exhibition uh, Diane curated like two years ago at the Chrysler Museum of Art in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and um, I found out at one point that the Great Dismal Swamp, I don't know if I pronounce that right, one of America's largest, but still and still intact habitat for many species is very, very close located to Norfolk. And I uh, made this uh, specific piece for this exhibition. And the, uh, the fascinating part of the Dismal Swamp is that it has a very kind of untamable, untamable, is that the word? A very dense wilderness. And it word. withstood, <laughs> sorry, I'm German, so I don't, sometimes I miss out on English words, but this, this thick wilderness withstood a lot of human attempts to change it. And I, of course, as soon as humans can enter something, it becomes an unknown world and a very exciting world. And, and so I pictured actually this um, as a, a, a sanctuary for animals and specific uh, for urban animals. So urban animals are the ones who lost their own habitat due to uh, human extension. And in, in a lot of works you see um, pearls, you know, the, the pearls and they make, of course, first of all, they make very beautiful uh, relief, but I also use them as a kind of metaphor to connect um, the, the creatures within the land and also the viewer, us, to somehow build the possibility of a connection uh, to the landscape. Would you mind uh, telling everybody how large this piece is? Oh, what okay. Is the size? Yeah, uh, this one, this one is uh, 80 inches wide and 60 inches tall. Thank you. And the, the pearls also important from, I use them as a metaphor for kind of for survival. They, they represent a kind of wealth and food in these uh, settings. And this is just like a um, constellation of the exhibition. Up, up to on the left side, you see the 
the piece installed in the galleries. Um, and on the bottom, that was actually photograph what inspired that um, particular uh, wall mural. And the exhibition also showed uh, one of my larger scale uh, sculptures. And this one is um, one of my snow children cast in, uh, in white glass, in opaque white glass. And these are my, so far my largest pieces I did. So hopefully something else comes after that, what gets bigger, but it's not that I want to make things bigger and bigger, but it was really beautiful to just reach like a life-size, um, make a life-size human figure. It was very beautiful, just the act of creating it and making it and forming it. And very quick, um, the, the snow children are basically inspired by a, a Russian fairy tale that deals with um, fragility and, but also strength of life. And in the story, a child is made out of snow and becomes alive. But the, the girl, it's a girl, it's also very vulnerable because of, of the danger, danger that she may can melt when the temperatures in spring and summer are rising. So she leaves always right before and hibernates every year and just returns into in, in, in the winter time. And she's always kind of protected by, by uh, birds. I have to say important, I forgot that. Um, for me, very important was to, to uh, make this piece out of glass, even if it's just, you know, opaque because it of course mimicked snow. And for me, glass, it's exactly like this. It's a very fragile material. It can melt, but it also represents life. So you always play with this balance of fragility and, and strength and uh, life. And in this exhibition, I also had these two, two uh, domes um, displayed and they are called uh, where the rubies grow. And for me, I mean, a lot of people are always asking me why, why are you using mostly hawks? But for me, they are just very simple. Um, like we all know, a kind of messengers. Um, they have a very sharp sight. They, they, they see things we are not able to see. Um, and in this uh, two pieces, for me, it was also extremely um, exciting to somehow uh, emphasize the beauty of ruby red glass. Um, and I, I also wanted to connect the ruby red glass to the uh, significance of the ruby uh, um, gemstone. And for me, they, they're basically just, um, these two hawks are basically just protecting um, the, the, the area, the land, whatever, where the rubies grow. And now a uh, quick to, um, to an exhibition. Uh, it was scheduled to open um, in April at the Heller Gallery. And like we all know, um, at that time, everything got canceled and <laughs> the show was moved online. Um, and this is a photograph I used for one of the major pieces in this exhibition. And I took this image um, north of New Orleans uh, at the riverbanks of the Chifangte River. And this is basically the outcome. And um, it's like, oh, it looks like a huge transformation and that's what it really is. Uh, for me, in this particular piece, it was important to create a kind of a portal or like a waterway with, with the idea that the viewer is kind of invited to join the girl and maybe also the coyote to enter this kind of new, unknown, mysterious world. Um, just to add this, I mean, overall, my work deals very often with our kind of disrupted relationship to nature, you know, with this kind of feeling that we basically, we don't fit in, but we are desiring to fit in. So there's always this kind of tension. And this is looking for ways how we make and connect by becoming more sensitive.
to just add a little bit of technical stuff. I mean, you see all these, these areas here, the, the ropes, these were actually found on that riverbanks and then I use them to um, slump the, uh, the glass plates over these ropes. And the glass plates are all uh, opaline striking glass. And that's why they have this kind of beauty, kind of foggy appearance or also in certain light, that kind of bluish um, reflection in the mirrored areas. This is a little bit like a detail of this piece to show also um, more the mirrored areas, which are for me very important. I mean, first of all, they mimic water very beautifully, and but they also function as a reflection. So we as, as the viewer can see ourselves and they reflect also the surrounding area of the room so that basically everything becomes part of, of that particular scene and landscape. And in addition, it's also um, beautiful that depending on how the light hits the piece, it changes. I mean, the reflection of light change during the day. And in this case, it looks uh, more golden instead of blue. And for me, that makes it always, for me, it's always super important that something, what I make becomes kind of alive and all these elements add to this kind of feeling that things become alive. This is just a detail what I, I showed because um, like this whole virtual thing, you never really see the depth of the relief. And in certain areas, these plates have a, have a depth of, or the relief is sometimes until, uh, almost like two inches. The exhibition was called, um, titled Backwater. And this is like kind of a, a landscape where I live. I mean, I don't live right there, but very close by. And I visit this, the Mississippi River every, almost every day and it changes all the time. And for me, the backwaters <clears throat> are very fascinating because they also create this kind of protected islands. So it's not just threatening, you, you know, to have them. It's also shows you how valuable a little protected island can be. And this whole idea inspired um, this, this panel. It's basically um, where the painter in this case finds his safe spot. This is like um, larger single pieces um, of glass. It's, it's uh, opening over a kind of a light kind of grayish blue glass. And that's a detail that's these areas are all mirrored. And then I highlight the beads in this case and the, the relief cast of the bead of the pearls in this area by using also um, silvering. And this is one of the, the sculptures in the show um, is a title, uh, Rising Fawn. And it's for me just a very peaceful idea you know, the, the little fawn it is all life size kind of, you know, like a fresh born little deer. Um, it also finds his, his or her kind of safe place within that little um, water puddle or glass nest or whatever, I don't know. Um, I had a lot of fun playing with all the different whites in this. You know, that's from, from the opaque, the body of the animal is all opaque. And then I used uh, some opaline glass, clear glass. I did a lot of different surfaces like um, engravings so that all the different whites have a kind of a different appearance. And this is a, a landscape what's not related to um, the Southern landscape in America. That's more, that's a piece from from Bavaria, where I also live sometimes four months of the year, mostly in the summers. And our little house there is surrounded by fields and also sunflower fields, which are, of course, everybody knows are always super dramatic. So how many different stages sunflowers go. And even there, you find these little water puddles, backwaters, whatever you call them. And for me, they always represent also this kind of small microcosmic 
spots where you can somehow can find a whole entire world within this little water pots. And for me, seeing it this way, it's always about appreciation, appreciation also of very small, often very overseen areas. That's uh, like my last uh, major um, sculpture from the size, I mean, I call it panther, but it's not quite as large as a full size panther. It has a size maybe of a larger bobcat. And um, I made this piece kind of as a dedication to the Florida panther, what's an endangered species. And during, especially during, during the lockdown, um, he was still around and I started adding all these kind of black pearls uh, to his body. And for me, that was a kind of a gesture, a kind of ap uh, appreciation of the kind of majest majestic animal. Yeah, he became a kind of close to me since he was a little bit like my Corona buddy and still is. <laughs> and I think that's it for, for my side. Thank you so much, Sibylla, for showing those images of your wonderful work and for talking a little bit about it. Um, I will ask Diane if she could uh, show us her images and then we can maybe talk a little bit. And I'm just gonna say, for those of you who are asking about dimensions, the Panther, I know that there was a link posted to the exhibition um, on our website, which does have all the dimensions for the images that um, the cur of the current work, but I am reading here that the panther is 14 inches high, 28 inches wide, and 22 inches deep, just for those who wanted to know. Diane, would you be so kind and- I will. So let me start this. Okay. Um, well, thanks so much. I just um, wanted to say a quick thank you, certainly to everyone for coming and uh, for Katya for the informa uh, invitation. And then of course to uh, Stabella for making such beautiful and meaningful work. So I just wanted to take a couple of minutes because I know you probably all have a lot of questions too for Sabella to talk about this one work by her Mississippi Banks, which is now in the collection at, at the Toledo Museum as of two, uh, 2018. Um, and to talk about it in the context of two other works that are within also within the collection. I feel like um, my role as a curator is to, to take it once it, it comes into the collection and put it into some context and start to talk about it as it relates to the other work here in, in the building. Um, and also to introduce some ideas that might provoke a conversation um, either between us tonight, perhaps for you to think about in the future or, and for visitors as they come and see this. So in 2019, we opened an exhibition called Global Conversations, Art and Dialogue which is a rotation of works from the permanent collection, both contemporary and historic, where Mississippi Banks went on view for the first time. Um, the idea here being to draw out themes, really kind of common themes from across cultures and, and time um, in a way that we can try to broaden the narrative of art history and try to expand on the, the stories that we're telling. Um, and of course, so beautifully expressed in Mississippi Banks is this theme, this idea of landscape. And as you think about this work and the other two that I'm gonna show you, you can I think, think about it in two different ways, both in terms of an external landscape or the natural one, and also the internal landscape or the imagined one, that, that of memory. So in uh, Promise and Perception and Chin and Landscapes, the exhibition that, that I worked on a couple of years ago, I. I wrote a couple of paragraphs and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit and read a little bit from those that talks about this work. Um, so as we know, Sibella was um, born and raised in Germany where there's this rich tradition of uh, glass making that influences her training, but also the abundant uh, Bavarian forests, I think, which have in part inspired her choice of landscape as a predominant theme. Um, in this work using 63, a two-dimensional kiln form panels, she's created this really poetic narrative about the enigmatic relationship between humans and the natural world. And within this magical environment, she creates a space 
that I feel like is for contemplation where we can uncover, perhaps recover or reveal the uh, secrets of coexistence. So the setting of Mississippi Banks, as she talked about, and she showed you the photograph that this came from, um, captures this river in New Orleans near her home. And later then she adds these two figures who are absorbed in their exploration of their, their surroundings, certainly. Um, and these figures, I think, reinforce the physical nature of the landscape. Um, but also to do that, Sabella created molds of tree branches and other found elements that are then used to give the glass uh, panels texture and dimension. Um, particularly, I think of note is the, the wonderful soft color palette, these hues of gray, purple, white, blue, silver. There's some gold in there. And then there's this milky translucence of the opaline glass that evokes a sense of hope and possibility. Um, and the riverbank very much becomes a place of refuge, um, of beauty and of solace. And these kind of silvery strands of pearls that you see conjure up these feelings of desire and longing um, and very much symbolize a, uh, a promise to connect us to the landscape. So then not too far away um, in another gallery that focused also on uh, nature and especially on sights and sounds of nature is this um, really brilliant and ethereal video installation. And I, I will try in just a minute to, um, to show you a little clip of that video. But uh, this is by the British artist David Hockney. It's called Woolgate Woods Winter. It's from 2010. And it captures this really magical place that's actually from his childhood. Um, interestingly, I think uh, there's interesting kind of comparisons and differences that you can draw both between Sibella and David as artists and certainly between the work. Um, they're very, from very different places, certainly Sibella uh, born in Germany, living in the South in New Orleans and Hockney, uh, a Brit, but who spent a lot of time in Los Angeles. I think that Hockney in this um, video captures uh, a sense of life uh, it's interesting, he's divided this also into sections. Um, there, there are nine of them and each one actually is a camera mounted on top of a, of, a, of a moving car. So the moving image actually carries you down this road through this wintry scene that um, like Sabella's image also has this wonderful kind of silvery blue, white, gray palette. Although for me, Sabella, Sabella's image very much evokes the warm southern kind of moist location while David's is the dry, cold, wintry scene. Um, this video runs for a, a glorious 49 minutes across this grid comprised of nine screens and it's a little over eight feet by about 14 feet. Um, one of the things I sort of think about when I, I watch this, but I also look at Sabella's work is the different perspectives that you have going down this uh, road or looking at the Mississippi banks, um, almost simultaneously, um, you can kind of take in all of these uh, images, but you also can kind of hone in on individual ones as well. So just to kind of emphasize, you know, the, the um, grid nature and sort of the way I think honing in on the, the sections of the grid allow you to kind of focus in on the, in this case, the individual image, the individual uh, uh, figures that um, while they're certainly seen together as a whole are very much, I think also alone um, in their um, moment of kind of concentrating uh, and looking um, at whatever it is that they're examining out there um, in, in nature. I think Mississippi Banks and, and David Hockney's Winter um, can both be viewed as a space kind of of and for uh, emotions and, and thinking and examining uh, memory uh, and imagination in landscape, um, possibly uh, uh, solitude as well. Um, I think the perspective is interesting thinking about um, Hockney and David Hockney's image. You actually are the viewer, you're experiencing it firsthand as you're kind of driving down the road um, and in this particular instance, the, the, the children are experiencing firsthand and you are drawn into this, um, I hope through their, their own imagination. We're not young anymore, we're not the children, but we can participate 
um, through the aspect of, uh, of imagination. I think this work uh, and, and David's invite us to kind of into a journey into the unknown, into a uh, kind of undefined place of possibility and certainly um, of mystery as well. So um, while I was thinking about um, Mississippi Banks and then, uh, and then the winter scene, I also uh, was thinking about um, how Sabella might place herself into an environment and the images that she was conjuring up. And so I, I pulled these two images, which are from her. Um, the one on the left is a photograph by a 19th century uh, uh, artist who actually wanted to be a landscaper, but turned out to be a commercial photographer and instead named George Barker. Um, this is an image that I know Sabella was interested in because she posted it on her Instagram page and I, I borrowed it from there. And then the one on the right is actually, a, a, I think, sentimental, um, kind of emphasis on the sentiment, a little watercolor that she sent me while I was working on this exhibition of the Choctaw Indians that are on the banks of the Mississippi River. Um, and so I started to think about how Sabella's work um, might be integrated into galleries that are also showing landscape. Um, and in particular, in a place like Toledo, we have American galleries that show quite a few landscapes and how we might kind of start to relate those um, and kind of stitch them together. Um, so I just am showing you a little detail here of some, some uh, things that kind of ran through my mind in terms of looking at these uh, two works kind of next to each other. I think in particular, the formal qualities that I saw you know, between them. And I saw this little um, space, this little kind of um, structure, this lean-to that was created in the photograph that Sabella showed of the branches that kind of offer this structure that protects the small children. And of course, in the watercolor, um, protects the, the Indian family that's on the banks of the river. And I, I love the way the structure kind of like points you up to the top of the image as well. Um, and for, uh, I think kind of some interesting reasons, this kind of formal quality and thinking about landscape also then led me to this particular work, um, which is by Frederick Remington, who was born in 1861, died in 1909. Uh, and the title of this painting is Indians uh, Simulating Buffalo, painted at the, at the very end of his life in 1908. Um, it, it was actually a very early work that came to Toledo, it entered into the collection in 1912, which was the, the year um, the museum opened actually. And in this scene, uh, you know, I started thinking about these figures that are in this scene and how they're somewhat obscured. They're kind of lost in this landscape until you start to kind of examine them closely. And you see that these two, there are two men slumped over these horses. Um, and they're, they're enticing, not only because you're kind of looking at them, trying to discover who they are and what they're doing, but, but they're also mimicking the form of the animal, the buffalo. And this was a hunting trick that they, they mimic the form to try to entice the buffalo over. Um, and I certainly thought about that in terms of like the, the children in Sabella's work and how they kind of entice you into the image. Um, the color palette also really struck me, the, the kind of strike of blue across the top of the uh, painting, in this case, the sky, and then there's this beautiful strike of blue in the river in Mississippi Banks. Um, these wonderful kind of flecks of gold in the field that you see in the strands of pearls in Sabella's work, and then these beautiful pink tones that you see in these incredible shadows that are made by the, the horses and the men. So. It, Interestingly, um, I also sort of saw this, again, kind of a formal quality of this, um, this shape, this kind of uh, form that was coming up above the figure, this line kind of directing you up, this, this triangular shape directing you up to the top of the painting. Um, and thinking again of, of perspective and how we perceive um, what it is that, that we are looking at. Um, in Remington's painting, certainly, Remington himself very much a voyeur um, in looking at this landscape and then painting it and interpreting it for us. Um, again, in Hockney's work, something we are the participant and in Sabella's work, um, then we're invited to participate again kind of through the, through the children. So those are just a couple of um, thoughts that I had and in, in how I might perceive uh, this work and kind of relate it to other things that are in the collection. 
um, you move from a, a Mississippi banks to an English winterscape to the Western prairie and then back to the Southern uh, shores of the river again. You think about how we can write glass and video and painting, um, thinking about some of the formal qualities of color and light and the qualities of these qualities and then also of perspective. Um, one of the things that Sabella sent me, uh, uh, and I'll just end with this in terms of uh, thinking about our relationship to nature and how we relate to this work. She says that one of her aspects of her work explores disrupted relationship to nature, um, how we as humans displace uh, nature with our purportedly civilizing accomplishments, yet we learn or yearn for an ability um, to be reunited with the natural world. She says, in my landscapes, I try to create spaces which function um, as a refuge and escape and where we can reconnect to nature um, and possibly with ourselves. So um, I leave you with that and uh, turn it back over to Katya. Thank you so much, Diane, for that. That was wonderful and so nice to see the relationship between some of the other works that are in the museum's collection. Um, it was really, I, I saw the exhibition that had the Hockney in it and the, and Sibylla's work and I was really so struck by the, by the relationship between the two works that spoke to one another across time and media and um, really enriching both experiences of looking at them. It's, um, it's truly mesmerizing and you can sit, it, it goes for 45, as I said, 49 minutes as you are driven. Is really um, that that piece is amazing as is Sibylla's work and as I as we were speaking about this Sibylla Diane and I I also was uh, remarking on what a exuberant feeling um, you know this piece as well as Sibylla's work has um, and wondering about how that is created, you know, in, in that it partly is in the palette in the richness of the images and also in the richness of the material that Sibylla uses. But I, but I also want to actually touch base a little bit um, on, with you, Sibylla, on the, on the ruby pieces. And um, I know that you said that you are working with that glass yeah. on a future body of work. And I, and I want to touch on it because actually, to me, it always um, kind of brings up the, the work of um, the German cinematographer and director Werner Herzog. Um, Herzog made a movie in 1976 that was called, that is called The Heart of Glass. And it's actually about this quest for ruby glass. Um, and in fact, um, in reading about it, which I didn't remember from watching it, and it's been a long time since I saw the movie, but um, Herzog says that he used um, a number of landscapes to kind of evoke this idea of this like mysterious uh, 18th century Bavarian forest. And he combined, in fact, the um, Alps, which is where, you know, this takes place partially, um, as well as the um, Skellig Islands in Ireland, as well as Yellowstone Park um, landscapes, which I thought was very interesting. And I just wanted you to talk a little bit about the uh, your future kind of work there. Yeah, I mean, this is like a huge question because I can't really answer it. I'm just um, dealing with a lot of technical questions and um, I unfortunately I also I, I was ready to to uh, do a Corning residency in in October but it was uh, canceled but hopefully it will happen next year so I'm very excited that I can try out um, one of my ideas uh, how to um, incorporate kind of ruby glass and make it to something um, related more to, to its mystery and how we perceive this glass, including the history of it and special, and also of course connecting it to this movie. So there's so much um, to deal with that 
I, right now, since everything is in this development, I can only describe it with, with words. You know, we say Schlagwörter in, in, uh, in German. And I, all I know is that I want to get the feeling of seduction, obsession, blood, apocalypse. And what is right behind you, Sidwa, seems to be some red work or is that a wax? <laughs> this is like a, it's a red glass. It's not the right color, but uh -huh. I just had put some light behind it. So you see a little red, but this is, it's unfortunately not ruby red, but it's still red. And anyway, I will just experiment um, with all the different shades of reds to make also like a like a kind of a wall a wall panel you know it's very pretty so i like to try mm -hmm. to get different shades mm -hmm. so you have also the very dark uh -huh. you see it? yes we can see it <laughs> the whole world is red around you i mean normally it's always i think when an artist or at, in, at least in my case when you just starting and working it's very hard to define concrete the outcome um, it's just something what makes me extremely excited and um, the goal is to create like a, a space like a room mm -hmm. with the idea when you enter it that you are overwhelmed okay. <laughs> so okay. that's a classic art we're, idea we're gonna look for, out for that some overwhelmed feeling and i have we have a couple of questions here does the bell jar and closing the birds have a conceptual meaning for you and for the work to you Yes, I, I mean the, the 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 dome or the bell jar, also already in Victorian times was always there to to protect uh, to protect something very valuable, and I use it the same way to and to protect something what I think it's very precious and um, also as for its own. I don't know why I think a hog is always a he she its own space and its own kind of universe where nobody can touch the animal. So it's like a kind of protected space. The nice, I mean, I don't know if you saw it in the image, but I use um, half of the dome is uh, mirrored. So you have um, also this kind of depth and endless feel of, of, of the glass in the reflection what becomes very uh, interesting, especially when you use a uh, red glass. It's, and these are all ideas I want to also um, work there, on for, for the future. There are a few other questions. There's another question about, um, are there any fairy tales associated with some of your work? You already mentioned the one with the- with the Yeah. Yes. Um, but are there others that you um, particularly so Not in particular. Okay. In the very old days, I maybe did some. And then there's two questions uh, from Tim Tate. One is about um, what artwork influences your work, or what you know, what artwork, other artwork, I guess, other artists. And related to that, um, I know you're close to Ervin Aish. How has that influenced your work, or has that influenced your? Yeah, work? I mean, he he influenced me immense because um, I met him when I was extreme, when I was very young, like 19 years old. Uh, I went to- Did, did Ervin teach at the school in Zizel? No, he would refuse to teach in a school that conservative. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I learned just very stubbornly um, and I appreciate that I learned all the stubborn, uh, strict ways how to work with glass, you know, from engraving and painting, enameling, and so on and and but then when I met Irvin he opened this whole other world and I always felt like that I I needed to find kind of my own vocabulary and my own voice and he told me forget about glass just study sculpture or painting and that's what I did so was, was, was would you say that he was the person who kind of influenced you to go to oh, yes. uh, to school 100% aha uh -huh. interesting um, and so the other question is, how autobiographical do you think your work is? I, I still don't know. <laughs> you, you're not sure about that? Is I it mean, all I can say is that when I work, I, I'm very, um, I work very much by myself. I don't have anybody who 
I wouldn't like if to have somebody who would produce the work. I mean, maybe when you have a really big project, but I really enjoy making, going through all these processes by myself because I learned so much during that process and it gives me so many other ideas I would otherwise miss. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it is kind of related. I mean, of course it's related to me. You have said that, for example, some of the land um, near where you grew up was really a fertile ground no pun intended, yes. um, for, for, for both, you know, your play and later for your work, though. Yeah, that's correct. So um, I grew up in Germany in this very uh, heavy industrial area um, compared in the States to Pittsburgh, but even two times, I do a million times bigger, it feels like, because so many cities are connected there and it's coal mining and steel mining and we as kids were, would play really on the coal piles and in all this kind of what I call, uh, call urban landscapes. And I think it, it helped me uh, to become sensitive for small areas, to, to find even in very small spots like, like this kind of beauty and universe what, what otherwise I was not able really to see. I mean, there was not much forest, but somehow you focus on other things, on little things. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and a related question here is, are the children in your work ones in your life? Are they nieces or godchildren or are they fantasy children? No, they're all, they're all alive and exist. <laughs> some are alive just in my head and some are <laughs> real alive. Um, and when you say they're they're alive in your head, how how do you where, where do you get the images then? I mean, especially in my uh, or the let's say that the piece what's behind Katya, what she put up, um, these are images I used over the time, like from actually from medical books, from children um, diseases who had like kind of imperfections and I use these images to, co to um, combine with nature to give to maybe that to that gesture or process process that um, that they would heal and over the time I mean not just these but over the time I, I have a gigantic collection of um, children images especially and also animal images and somehow um, they become a little bit like my protagonist. So I, they are like a kind of alive to me because they are always around and I always also use sometimes the same one for a new piece. That sounds interesting. And so, so do you, when you say you have a whole collection of them, do they, um, when you see a certain landscape, do certain, like, do you, certain of your characters come to your, to come to mind more than others, obviously, or yeah. how does that work, the process of selecting them? Yeah, it's normally works together. I see the landscape or the, the image of the child, and I can picture it already in that image, visually, it's out and, and make the final decision. And I asking, do a Photoshop are, too. Are they, are they in diapers? Mm -hmm. Does that, is that trying to show their age or are they just in it's just underwear clothes? underwear no diaper no diapers okay and and there was a technical question here if you ever experiment with found or recycled glass maybe in my in my one of my very first castings i used glass um i found on the foundry floors you know all the droppings and i uh, used this glass to to um to make one of my my first uh, glass sculptures and it's a very dense and like marble looking interesting structure uh, or surface and and feeling mm -hmm. i haven't done it done this for a while but most of most of the landscapes we saw were made with the opaline glass is that right yes that's correct and is there is there a particular reason for that yeah i, I mean we all um the glass people especially know the opaline is a very seductive color and it, it, it builds this kind of overlay, this kind of veil and this and somehow, um, uh, how you say this now, this word highlights 
or emphasize also the, the mystery of the landscape. You know, it's not right in your face. Everything has this kind of foggy layer. And of course, Opelin has this amazing quality of having this blue shades and also this warm orange shades, depending mm -hmm. on the light source. Mm -hmm. So do, do you ever do you ever feel that the that the use of the glass is somehow hindering you um, from like expressing the landscape in a certain way? You know, like when we looked at some of the pieces that Diane showed, it's it's easier in some ways to to get a certain palette from paint than it is from a sheet of opaline glass. Mm -hmm. But you have this way of using it that kind of explores the whole range of the color. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm of course hooked to using glass. I, I do not, I am not just working with glass. I'm doing a lot of paperwork. I mean, a lot of works with paper, um, mostly transparent papers who I glue together and attach together to also create a kind of a, a depth. I use um, like the piece behind Katya, it, it's a plexiglass where I carve from the back. Um, but I always come back to glass because I think it's really a really important material to me. First of all, it, it, it came to me very naturally because I grew up with it. And I also, like a lot of people who work with glass, love this challenge. You know, this every day you have to figure out how to use it. And there's a whole nother layer, you know, beside the idea just to fight the material. And then at the end, see it in this beautiful, satisfying way, hopefully. <laughs> and I see a huge potential, you know, for, for the future, for this material. And An endless possibility. That, that sounds like there's a lot of work ahead. <laughs> a lot. I hope I live much longer. Good. We, we, we do too. <laughs> anyway, um, well, I think we are almost out of time. Oh, there's one more question we're going to ask it here. Can you tell us a bit about the process you use in your sculptures, the snow girl, and how long a piece like that is in progress? Uh, like like the this, this, this snow child. Okay. I mean, it's it's a uh, the, it's a very classic uh, lost wax process. So I um, I formed certain areas by clay originally. I have also some dummy molds. I I make um, a wax from, and then I form at the end. I I make the whole wax in one piece together, and I work a lot with wax. You know, wax is it's my favorite material after glass even if it's kind of nasty and sticky, but I, I love to add detail. And after I have my wax positive, I, I make a, a silica plaster mold, or I use often um, silicon mold mix six, what's more like the ceramic shell material. The wax will be melted out, and then I have the basically the negative um, mold to melt the glass into. And it takes forever. It sounds very easy. The whole process is at least since I, I have only one kiln. So it takes quite some time. So so can you can you give a kind of a rough estimate of how long a piece like the snow child, even though of course it's made over time um, in parts, can you give a rough estimate of how long it takes to say? Yeah, maybe it's like a, like the longest. Okay, sorry, it's maybe around the three months idea. Three months? Where I always would work on things at the same time because, you know, like everybody knows with the glass people that like big, large glass pieces have to be in the, in the kiln at least for up to three weeks. So during this time, you always do other stuff. Oh. That sounds great. I see Thank you, thank you for explaining that. We have a couple of comments here. Um, Judy, who asked the question about the process, is thanking you and thanking everyone for the beautiful, thanking you for the beautiful work. Um, yes, this will be on, on YouTube and on Vimeo. We will post a link. Um, and Diane said, it doesn't sound easy to make those pieces, Sibylla. Um, 
So we are so appreciative of you um, being here tonight, both of you, Diane and Sibylla. We also um, are so appreciative of all of your work, Sibylla. Thank you so much. And this piece behind me, I just wanted to say, since Sibylla referred to it several times, um, is, is um, called Elderberries. Um, as Sibylla said, it's a, it's a piece made out of acrylic plexiglass and mixed media. So Sibylla works in other materials other than glass, obviously. Um, and um, we will end on that note.